action. Passion. Emotion. Motion. It's one of those things that's kind of hard to define, isn't it? But when you sense it or see it, it makes sense. Now, I want you to try to put these together. How about disordered affection? What's that look like? When you have something that's disordered and you put it together with affection, now you have disordered affection. So now you have something that's chaotic love. Or maybe like a cluttered passion. This, you guys come up with this. This messed up. It's you. Right? <laughs> you have a, a, many, a panic emotions. But what you have, you have something that isn't working, right? It's like it's, it's out of order. It doesn't work. And um, that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about disordered affections. And I want to make this statement, because I'm going to make it a few times tonight, but I want you to hear this. And this doesn't come from me. It comes from a guy named Paul Tripp. But it's a profound statement. Here it is. That whatever rules, whatever rules or is the object of your heart's deepest affections will have an inescapable influence over your lives and behavior. I'll say that one more time. That whatever rules your heart or is the object of your heart's affection will have an inescapable, I mean you cannot avoid it, an inescapable influence over your lives and over your behavior. So here's my confession. You know, I've learned in the last seven or eight months how profound it is when you can learn to tell the truth to yourself about yourself. You know how hard it is to tell the truth sometimes? You know the person that's usually the hardest to tell the truth to? is yourself, isn't it? Because, you know, when you get gut honest with yourself, you know then, okay, what am I going to do with this? Like, every time I look in the mirror, and I know I've been truthful to myself about myself, then something's got to give. Or I'm going to live this schizophrenic, divided life, and it's really hard to do that. Or live walking around thinking you're a fake. I'd rather just people know the truth about me and see me for what I am, and at least then we can be in ground zero and move from there. So here's a wild thing. It's pretty crazy for me to stand up here and say to you guys that I'm a thief and I'm also an adulterer. And here's what I want you to know. So are you. Every one of us in this room is or has been a thief, and every one of us in this room has been or is an adulterer. And you're going, for some of the guys who are dude, I haven't even been out with a girl in two years. <laughs> what are you talking about? I want to give you this. Imagine for a minute that you finally found the person of your dreams. And you come to that point in your relationship together where you say, you know what? We're going to spend the rest of our lives together. And you enter into this thing called a covenant or a marriage. Where you basically say, everything I am and everything you are, now we're going to sign up for the rest of our days until death do us part, whatever life brings, to spend our lives together. And we're going to be, anything we're going to be together is we're going to be loyal. You can trust me. You will never have to worry about whether you can trust me. But one day, imagine this, that event happens and you seal this thing, you get married. And after about a year and a half or two years of marriage, you come home one day a little early from work. And you hadn't anticipated this, but uh, you pull in and your spouse's car is there. That's like odd, because typically they're at work too. And you open the door and you go into the living room and you hear a little noise in the back room down towards your bedroom. And that seems kind of odd because Usually nobody's home this time of day. And you begin to walk down the hallway and you hear a little bit more noise and your mind begins to wonder, please tell me what's running through my mind right now is not what I'm about ready to encounter. In fact, crazy thing is you get close to the bedroom and you find a piece of clothing right outside the bedroom door. And now your heart's starting to beat really fast. And then you hear something going on in your bedroom. And you know there's not just one person in there. 
And typically, if there's more than one, you're the other one. And you open the door, and you find, quote, your lover in bed with another lover. Let me ask you, what do you think you feel? This is what I want to talk about tonight. Because quite frankly, when I told you that I'm a thief and an adulterer, what I meant is this. Nothing, nothing, nothing will define you or define me or any person on this planet more than ultimately what we orient our lives around. Let me put it to you another way. Nothing will define any of us more than what we worship. John Calvin said it this way, that our hearts are an idol factory. It's not if they are going to worship something. It's just what will it be that they will worship? What will it be that we're going to actually give our ultimate allegiance to? And when our affections are ordered and not disordered properly, Life works differently. I can tell you this. If we get what we're going to talk about tonight right, it covers a multitude of sins. But I want to submit to you that every day, the pain that you see in your life and experience around you, things you hear on the radio, things you read in the newspaper, things like malicious involved in helping to stop, like sex trafficking and other things like this, no gals, poverty. You're going to see things. Your culture, we see it, is due to this one thing that we have literally, as a people and as a culture, we've gotten in bed with the wrong lover. We've given our affections to the wrong thing. And nothing defines us more. You see, because what rules our hearts, or is the object of our heart's deepest affections, has an inescapable influence over our lives and our behavior. This word worship's an intriguing word and it, it really, very simple, worship means is to give worth to something that is its due. And so when you think of worship, worship is determined, think about this, by what we look to, whether you are a believer or not. Like I would say, wherever you are spiritually in here now, tonight, you might come and say, oh, I, mean, I don't know if I'm into this God thing, I just need to check this out, that's fine. But I'm telling you, there's not a person on this planet that does not worship something. There is not a person on this planet who is not in bed, so to speak, in their heart with something that they have not given their ultimate allegiance to. And for most of us, it goes no further than me. Most of us are in bed with ourselves. The biggest God that we're going to have to deal with out there is not something else. We're going to look at a few of those, but it's really me. But worship is ultimately defined by what we look to. Think about this to define us, to lead us, to protect us, to fulfill us, to inspire us. You know, think about it. We tend to worship what we, if we get it right, what we know defines us. We worship if we get it right what is worthy of leading us. If we, when we worship, we get it, if we get it right, we, we define or worship what we know will protect us and inspire us and fulfill us. And then we give our esteem and our honor and our attention and, if you will, our affection to it. And so when I said to you that I'm a thief, what I mean is this, that I've actually stolen the honor and the esteem and the affection that's due to God. And I've ripped it away in my own soul and I've given it to something else. I've taken from it and given it to something else. And when I say to you that I've committed spiritual adultery, that literally I've taken the love and the affection that God alone is worthy of because of who He is. And I've given it to lesser things, many things that I've come up with myself or the culture's come up with. It says, back, give yourself to this. This will work for you. And I listen to it. And I really believe this, that if you look at the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there are a lot of sub-stories in there, but one of the great sub-lines, I mean, the, the great main through lines of this whole thing is this, is about God reorienting 
our lives or God reorienting our loves from idolatry to himself. And get this, we'll never get there apart from him. So imagine this. You go in the room and find your lover in bed with another lover. What do you think the lover that's in the bed is going to think they're going to get from the one standing at the door? A high five? You think they're going to, that person going to try to help the two that are in bed? I know this sounds crazy. I don't know any other way to get this into our hearts and minds tonight. But then God is literally the one standing at the door. And he says, not only am I going to help you, I'm going to die for you. And I'm going to rise from the dead so that you can get your act together again. And I'm going to take you back from my own. How crazy is that? That he has thieves and adulterers like me back, like you back. And when we get that, not only that he loves us, but actually forgives us, our lives can change, friends. Some of us in this room are stuck because you really don't believe it. You might believe, I, I think I love him. But some of you don't equate that love with forgiveness. Like someone said this to me once, that our lives change to the degree that we really know we're loved. And then another guy said, yeah, they really change to the degree that we know we're forgiven. So let me define idolatry. Then I want to look at a couple of passages and uh, share a little illustration. And then we're going to talk briefly before we end how we kill some of these things. Does this make sense to you all so far? Because I know none of you struggle with idolatry. So let's, uh, let's define idolatry. Any ideas? Anybody know? Uh, how would you define it? Let's say you're having lunch with a coworker, or maybe you're going out for a glass of wine or a beer. If you drink beer, I don't know what to do. And you're sitting there talking. All of a sudden, this word idol comes up, you know? And you think, well, gee, American Idol. I go, oh, okay. Uh, who's that country dude that won that? I don't know. Okay, I got it. So well, what, 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 when you think idol, like, well, how would you describe an idol? Yeah, go ahead. And it takes the place of God. Yeah, so it takes the place of God. Um, anybody want to add to that? Misplaced affection. <laughs> there you go, misplaced affections, yeah. Or the Jesuits say disordered affections. Um, and guess what we mean by disordered affections? The affections aren't bad. A lot of times, as we'll see, a lot of times we can make an idol out of a good thing. It's not that it's a bad thing, it's just out of order. There are a lot of good things that we just want more from and they can actually deliver. And so then, what's a good thing becomes a crazy thing because it owns us and it runs us and it's really not capable of it. We learn to give our heart and soul to something that has no capacity to be what we want it to be. We say, make me happy. Have you ever had an argument with money? <laughs> You take it and go, look, I was told you could make me happy. It says here, in God we trust. Like, go on. I, somehow I don't really feel more secure. My friends think I'm some good, I got money, but see, when I go home and I look in the mirror, I still got to deal with me, and I don't like what I'm looking at. This doesn't answer life's ultimate questions. People I love still die. And bad things still happen. You know, all kinds of crazy things going on, don't we? Let me give you a working definition of an idol, because it's exactly this. It takes the place of God. Let me put it to you a different way. An idol is anything that we ultimately look to to give us our sense of well-being other than God. I don't mean maybe momentarily, but I mean anything that we ultimately look to, center our lives around give our allegiance to, to lead us, protect us, fulfill us, inspire us, anything that we ultimately look to to give us our sense of well-being deep in our soul, that life is good no matter how bad it can get out there. God, my sense of well-being doesn't come from the fray of life. It comes from you. It's anything other than God that ultimately gives us our sense of well-being. And in essence, we end up giving our life to an imposter to a pretender, to an illusion of what is best. So think about this for a minute. In the beginning, I just want to read you a few uh, things here. Genesis chapter 1. Just a few great lines here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amazing. In the beginning, then God said, let there be light. And guess what there was? Anybody? Light. Good. 
<clears throat> then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate the water from the water. Guess what happened? Exactly, exactly that. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that will bear fruit with seed of its own kind. Guess what happened? That's exactly right. Then God said, let there, uh, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. Guess what happened? That's good. It all took place exactly right. Then God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock creatures that move along the ground, wild animals, each according to its kind. Then God goes on and says, and now let God said, let us make man in our image. And guess what happened? God actually made man in his image, and we became to be. In essence, why should we have no other gods but God? This isn't hard. There aren't any. <laughs> so why are we so proficient of thinking that something ultimately other than him is going to make me in my deepest part of my soul? It's not to, that we don't need friendships, we do. And it's not that we don't need good work to give ourselves to, to have a sense that my life is counting for something, we do. But when those things get misplaced, and somehow God gets on the back burner or lower, and when the push comes to shove in life, and the heat of life gets turned up, what we're about, I'm telling you, is going to come to bear. And it's going to become very, very clear. In essence, what Genesis is saying there is no one else who is worthy to be the reference point for all things because he actually is the reference point of all things. Gentlemen, if you look to the culture to tell you what it means to be a man, you're never going to figure out what it means to be a man. Ladies, if you look to the culture to tell you what true beauty is, you will never figure it out. You will never be enough. And gentlemen, if we look to the culture to tell us the right kind of woman and what she has to be who's going to fulfill us, I'm telling you, excuse my French, it's going to be a cold day in hell before you may ever find that person. You know, I had a chance to do a lot of weddings. I just did one last night. And I love telling couples this. I just want you to tell you something. If you get into marriage, let me tell you what you're going to do. You think there's going to be a 50 years running around naked all the time making love, right? <laughs> You know, you might get a little bit of that. I hope you do. <laughs> as long as it's ordered affection. See, you can have disordered affection. You can have disordered affection even in marriage. But I say, you want to know what marriage is? You want to get clear about this? What God says, marriage is about romance if you help it to be and make it to be. See, good marriages don't just happen. And neither the bad ones. They both take a lot of work. People are like, wow, your marriage is bad because you didn't work at it. I go, oh, you worked at it. You worked at it really hard by ignoring it. You gave all your stuff to all over this, and you forgot this. See, marriage is about getting old together. 33 years I've been married. Love it. She's incredible. But it's also about sights and sounds and odors <laughs> and inconvenience. And getting up in the middle of the night and watching each other puke when you're sick. I'm dead serious. If you don't want that, don't get married. <laughs> Corey, am I lying? Uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> Christine, am I lying? <laughs> Thank you. I want to say, it's awesome. Because marriage is also known as that there's one person who looks you in the face and says, you know what? I know you like no one else. And I want you. I'm literally choosing to spend the rest of my life with you. And I've also told couples this. You may love him or her, but you're not meant to worship them. They're great, but they'll never meet all your needs. And the day you ask them to and expect them to, you've just made an idol out of something that will never fulfill your soul because it isn't meant to. He's your husband. He's not your God. She is your wife. She is not your God. And then, you know, in Exodus 20, God's reorienting Israel real quickly. You know, 400 years in bondage. 
They had their true God, but you know, generation after generation dies. They're in Egypt, and these people are worshiping pigs and all kinds of crazy stuff there. We don't have time to go into that. But God frees them. They're in the promised land. They're out in the middle of the desert. And God gives them these great things called the Ten Commandments. And he's reorienting them again to their true history, who he is and who they are in reference to who he is. And so Moses comes down, and the first commandment is what? You shall have what? No other, no other gods but me. You just came from a land of a lot of them. I'm asking you. Just one. And then, in Exodus 32, Moses doesn't come down from the mountain fast enough. You know, he goes to talk with God. And while he's gone, the people basically say this. They go to his brother Aaron and they say this. Look, we don't know what happened to that guy Moses. Oh, you mean the guy that helped you, the guy that used to literally liberate you from 400 years of slavery? That led you out here and God, through his hands, fed you day and night? Your shoes haven't worn out? Oh, you don't know about that guy? Yeah, so what do they do? They go to Aaron and they say, what? Let's make a God, right? And they take their gold and throw it in the fire. And, and it's interesting, when Moses basically comes back down from the mount, he, heals all, he hears all this rivalry going on and craziness. He confronts his brother about it. He goes, you know, we just threw this gold in there, and out came this calf. <laughs> and here's the crazy thing. Out came this calf. That calf was one of the fertility gods in Egypt. It marked in some strange way God's power taking care of these gods. And they thought, listen, we, we know what we were used to. We might have been slaves. At least we ate. Well, you know, you're also eating out here, too. And you aren't tilling crops out here. This is literally coming from the throne of God. Yeah, that guy Moses, man, we don't know where he went. Like, you know, our leader hijacked. He's out of here. So we're going to take matters into what? Our own hands. And Aaron says something really profound. He goes, but here's the deal. We were basically going to set up an altar to God, but now we're going to worship this other thing we made in front of the altar of God. So here's the deal. We're going to have the real God kind of around, and then we're going to worship something else on the side. Don't laugh. We all do it. I'm sure when the heat gets turned up in your life, here's your first reaction. God, man, I trust no one else but you. Then the heat gets a little hotter. God, I don't know how much longer, but I'm still in the game with you. A little hotter. Hey, God, we don't know what happened to this guy Moses. You know, you're a little slower than I wanted you to be. I'm starting to wonder whether you really have the capacity to take care of my life. I'm waiting for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright, whatever, Miss Wright, and I'm waiting, and you know, and all of a sudden we start. Let me ask you something. Just give me a couple names of some idols real quickly. Okay, Athletes. money. Athletes. Okay, yeah. sports. Career. Career. Huh? Yeah, careers. Music. Oh, music. Okay, keep going. Appearance. What? Appearance. Appearance. Yeah, you see, some idols aren't ones that necessarily are so obvious, like appearance. Sex. Sex. Glad somebody's being honest back there. <laughs> it's interesting. My friend Bob Bingham often says this. He goes, it's interesting. We live in a world that says, ah, sex is no big deal. Yet we're obsessed with it. You know what's the porn industry made last year? They want to take a guess? Pretty close to 15 billion dollars. That's a B. Billion dollars. And every time it's engaged in, it puts some people a little further in to the cage of slavery that they don't know how to get out of. Now let me ask you, is sex a bad thing? You guys are allowed to say, no. no. <laughs> it's a great thing. And so is the fire in the fireplace. Build it on your living room carpet, we got a problem. See, when it's disordered, we get chaos. And we don't talk about that much. You see, the problem's not money. The problem in your career. 
Problem in sex, problems not appearance, problem in sports, problem in music. But see, here's what we do. We live in this nice little Christian wall world that says this. You gotta watch out for all that stuff. This is all that visible stuff, you know? This is that visible. This is overt. You just got to read me a long list of this. Like, you gotta watch out for that stuff. So the goal of loving God, not to ever have sex. If you're married, then you only do it to have kids. And then I, that's not true, by the way. And then <laughs> you know, we make all this stuff. I want to ask you, keep, keep pushing this a little bit. Like, what? Why do these things have so much power? I mean, what is it that we're really looking for? What drives these things being so important? Help me here. Sin. Okay, sin, but keep going a little deeper. Like, what are we looking for in these? What's that? Work on it. Acceptance. Okay, acceptance. I, I didn't hear what you said. Work. Or work. Yeah, acceptance. Okay, keep going. I'm going to push even a little bit more. Let's go another level down. Fulfillment. Okay, fulfillment. Love. Okay, keep going. Certainty. What? Certainty. Certainty. Now we're getting in the ball game. Keep going. The need to desire things. What? The need to desire things. The need to desire something? Is that what you said? That's really good. If you guys, I'll tell you, desire is at the core of all of this. So just hold on to that word. It's a huge, great word. Desire. But keep going. What else are we looking for? You keep pushing down? Purpose. Security. Security. Purpose. Control. What's, what are you saying? Control. Control. I think there you got it. You keep looking at this. Let me ask you. Why do you think we have such trouble trusting God and wanting Him alone? Anybody? This isn't hard. I can tell you my answer because, see, I know me. I've learned, I'm trying to learn real quickly to tell the truth to me about me. Because you don't have any control. Because you don't have any control. And, and what, when you say you don't have control, like, I have trouble trusting God because why? He's good, but he's not safe. He's good, but he's not safe. When you say that he's good, he is, but he's not safe. When you say he's not safe, what's that mean? He doesn't know what's safe. He doesn't what? He doesn't do what he doesn't do what we want to do, to do. He doesn't show up when I want him to show up, so he's not sick. He might be good, but man, you're asking me to trust somebody who doesn't always run life the way I want him to run life. Where I don't always get what I want, and it means that I may have to live submitted to someone greater than me and trust his wisdom when I know for sure that I know what's best for me. <laughs> and I think God says then, go ahead, apply for my job. But I'm telling you, you can't ever have my job. You can pretend to be more than you are, and I'm less than I am if you want. But get, hence the words. You can pretend to be more than you are, and I'm less than I am. Here's a key, you guys, quickly. The scriptures are really clear. In Ezekiel, I want to read you something that was descriptive of the people of Israel in Ezekiel 14. That was really profound. And two of the great sins of the nation of Israel, and I think that we battle today, continue to be idolatry and injustice. And one really leads to the other. I believe this. That every one of the great heartaches in this world today, if you could trace it back and keep asking the question, it comes because we have misordered our lives around the true and living God. And when we do, it has an inescapable influence over our lives and our behavior. So listen to these words, Ezekiel 14, verse 1. Some of the elders of Israel came to me, that means to Ezekiel, the great prophet, and sat down in front of me. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, these men have set up idols, get this word, in their hearts, and have put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Now should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. When any Israelite or Pat Goodman, or people at Exit 242, I think you put that there, set up idols in their hearts, not up here, down here, in the invisible, in the more covert. When we set up the wrong idol here, it eventually is going to show itself here. What's ruling our heart here is going to go public. Just give it time. Give it time. 
And when these things begin to captivate us and take all our time and attention and affection, and we look to them to love us, to lead us, to inspire us, to take care of us, we're asking something of them they can't do. So the prophet goes on and says, Should I let them inquire of me? Therefore speak to them and tell them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. When any Israelite sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him myself in keeping with this great idolatry. And get this next verse. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for another lover or their idols. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you ever thought, why is it that I would ever go to something that's created before I would go to the Creator who made me for Himself? When you think about it, the God of the universe just said, let there be light, and there is. Let there be the expanse, and it happens. Let there be the animals, and they happen. Say, okay, God, here's the deal. You created the world. You created the stars, the constellations, the tides, the seasons. But you know, God, when it comes to my life, I just don't think you know what you're doing. So isn't that Genesis 3? Here's what God said, basically. This is the greatest issue in life. I promise you, for me, I'm learning this. It's not an issue of career, success, significant security. It's an issue of trust. That when we get that right, it covers a multitude of sins. When God created the world, Genesis 3, how many things did God say Adam and Eve could do? Anybody? Huh? How many things did he tell them they could do? Everything. Everything. How many is everything? Oh, everything. He made it really simple. Okay, now it's great. Everything. You can do anything. There's one thing I want you to do. Don't eat from that tree. Which, by the way, I think it looked good and it maybe was even good for food. That's not the point. You really think it was about the tree? The tree's just an object to prove a point. God's basically saying, look, it's all there. See how much you can trust me? Look at that. Look at the sunsets. Look at those trees. Look at the grapes over there. Oh, Adam, look at Eve. Yeah, good job, God. Eve, look at Adam. Not bad. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> look at those animals. You named them all. It's phenomenal. Look at this world. You can have all of this. And you and I can walk together and life will work. It doesn't ought to be because your affections are ordered. Just don't love something. I don't want you to love an essence. God's saying this. Just don't distrust me. The tree is about trust. And so the conversation begins with the evil one. Make him begin to wonder, does God really have your back? But he really means something. He's holding out on you. And I think at some point, you guys, when you and I don't believe that God doesn't have our back, or he's holding out on us, because life isn't going the way you want it to go, and I promise you, at some point, life is not going to go the way you want it to go. You and I can be disappointed without creating, committing idolatry. We can be disappointed and even bring our disappointments to God without running to something crazy to fulfill us. But here's the deal. When pain is in this heart is revolved around the wrong thing and it attaches itself to something that's wrong, we form these crazy attachments. And the crazy thing is, momentarily, some of these things make you feel better. Dallas Willard even said, you know, when you're in pain, the quickest way to feel alive is, you know what it is? It's go to your body. Your body will give you something back right away. It'll instantly give you, you know, a rush or make you feel better or make you feel something. And that's all that some people want. And I promise you, that's all you want. It's a bunch of little, you know, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. So no, no, no. When you attach yourself to where it's really meant to be, now that explodes into life, and God will begin to help us orient these things in a better way. They can actually become a part of our life without being my life. God will teach us how to order, if you will, our affections again. He wants to recapture our hearts. So here's my challenge as we close. I think one of the great keys in learning how to reorder our affections or kill the idols is a deeper grasp of the rescuing love of Jesus Christ. And what really I know in my own life has broken the power and is continuing to break the power of this crazy need for control. Because really it's all about, God, I trust you now. Okay, Pat. But you know, at one point in my life when my wife 
getting ready to lose our first son at seven and a half months into a pregnancy, I had a choice to make. Was I going to trust God again? Was I going to run to something crazy to make me feel better and get a better heart? We almost lost our daughter who was 18. People I love have died. Things I've tried haven't always worked. Let me ask you something. Do you have a trust button push lately? Our heart's going to worship something. We're going to look for something to lead us, to love us, to encourage us, to inspire us. And we're either going to give our love to Almighty God. Say, God, I don't get it. This hurts like that. Or we're going to commit spiritual thievery and spiritual adultery. And then maybe you can look in the mirror like I did one day and say, you know what? I'm a thief and I'm an adulterer. And I don't want to be that anymore. Because there's someone whose love and whose forgiveness is way more than my brokenness. Because you're a loved people. And what he wants to do is recapture your heart. It's the greatest thing you have. You know what idolatry is? It's taking what's meant to be together, and it's... And it's ripping it apart and trying to stick itself to something that doesn't stick. God says, why would you ever do that? You're meant for more. And if you as a generation of young adults can continue to get this, this world's going to be a different place. And somehow you can learn to order your affections. Because God has given us everything for our enjoyment, 1 Timothy 6. But he's not giving us everything to worship, just himself. To God be the glory, right? Forever and ever. Amen. Let me give you a moment just to be quiet. As I do, I think uh, Jess will make him up. But maybe just to have a moment to confess. Maybe there's something in your life that you just know God is out of order. Confess it to him. And here's the deal. Receive his mercy and grace again. God doesn't say this to keep guilt. He says it because he wants you to feel this conviction that would move you back to himself in a way so he might recapture your heart. So that you and I would not worship lesser gods. Because we're meant for more. Amen. Amen. If you're like me, if you look at some of the pain that you maybe you've had in your life, I bet you some of it is due to you believing that something up here going to get her done for you, and you didn't do it. He said, look, come back. Come back. Take a moment of just silence. If you feel like there's some business you need to do with God for a few minutes, and then Jesse and Rob will lead us. We'll sing a few more songs in response to Almighty God. Redemption's hell, where your blood.